When everyone else around you is trying to build a billion dollar unicorn, and a lot of them have built those billion dollar unicorns, you really start to think, not only can I do it, I should be doing it. Like, like what excuse do I have? Meet Sheridan. He's the co-founder and CEO of Lentable, a YC-backed fintech that helps employees max out their 401k and ESPP benefits. Before that, he was the youngest person to attend Northwestern at 15 before dropping out to pursue startups full-time. Today at just 21, he's a Forbes 30 under 30 Teal Fellow who recently closed an $18 million Series A valuing his company at close to $100 million. Today we talked to him about how he leveraged creators early on, his new venture fund, and the ins and outs of Lentable. So we're here with Sheridan and he is an awesome founder. Met him as we were coming out of a Y Combinator. So probably sometime back in August, August of 2020. Super smart guy. One thing that he used really well was content creators in order to actually do distribution. Would love for you to talk more about that. So I think our first introduction to big content creators is we had the Sway House. So we had Josh Richards, Griffin Johnson, Bryce Hall, a bunch of kind of members of that house end up investing in our company. And it was really kind of interesting seeing like the ways that they could help. There was like simple things of like, making a Twitter post and kind of getting likes and getting followers. I think some of the things that we didn't expect is it actually helped with hiring to some degree, like less so with people who are like 30 and 40 where they have no idea what the Sway House is. But we had some kind of interns. We had some, uh, you know, uh, first, second year grads who were like, wait, you guys are working with the Sway Boys. That's so cool. And it kind of just built, built up this, uh, this culture of like, oh wow, those are the kind of people who like I follow all the time. It's really interesting and engaging. So did they reach out to you or did you reach out to them? I'm trying to remember. We had gotten connected through like a mutual. So it was someone who was like, hey, like these guys are your age. They're looking at doing some angel investing. You should talk. When I met them, what I was so impressed by is Obviously, like they're very good marketers. They're very good at kind of building these TikToks that are virally engaging. But what was surprising is they're so business savvy too. There was all these kind of esoteric ways that they had of kind of like helping Lend Table. Like a lot of it from like an SEO perspective, it gave us a huge ranking uh, boost in kind of Google because we had all these articles, we had all this press, we had all these mentions and other news articles. And then also when it came to getting investors from LA, having that initial foundation and network out there was super helpful because a big thing with our business, we're in financial services, we're dealing with people's retirements, we're dealing with people's hard-earned money. And it's super important to have that like fundamental trust from them. And we found that like doing it through these celebrities, these influencers, people who are already touching these demographics is really helpful. So like even for just using kind of them as the seed to like talking with these other influencers and investors ended up proving to be really meaningful. So obviously there's a ton of pros, but are there any cons at all you say? Um, I could imagine how there's some cons that might be hard for us to perceive. Like to some degree, maybe if they hear that, like, you know, the Sway House is invested in the Lend Table, let's say you're someone who's 30. You might have this perception of the Sway House of like, ooh, like I don't want to touch that. You know, they never tell us that. The way they tell us would be not signing up. So I could definitely imagine how there's some kind of like reputational risk there of like, you don't necessarily want to partner with people where it could dilute your brand or kind of confuse your narrative. I'm sure there's some level of like controversy that they could get into where it's like, it could get back channeled back to Lend Table and be kind of bad and representative. But I'd say in our case, you know, the pros heavily outweighed the cons. One thing that I've been kind of concerned with is yeah, how, I guess, content creators can stay impartial while still being investors. Do you think there's a balancing act there? How do you think about that? So obviously, Sway House was the first like big name kind of people we had worked with. And since then, we've talked with a lot of people on TikTok, on YouTube, like even, you know, a, a, as an example, like you guys are an actual financial channel. What we've seen with the Sway House is that when they give recommendations of like, oh, go check out Lentable, it's no one explicitly going to them to be like, I want to figure out how to set up my 401k in retirement, and I'm going to use you as the source of truth. I think people can kind of distinguish the different between like, hey, I'm saying you should use this company and like, hey, I'm just like, recommending you check it out. I think that's definitely something we're cognizant of when working with some of these kind of financial creators, people who are, um, who might be more of these celebrities in the financial space where people really do go and take their advice and explicitly take that action. I can definitely see how it would be harder to have a, to be impartial because it's like you now have a financial incentive for that company to succeed. So maybe you care a little bit less about how much it helps people because like the thing you want is just to you know see that kind of equity value you have increase. You think you'd be able to separate the two that this is LeBron James telling me to drink Sprite because he likes it and he's paid by Sprite yeah. versus like, hey, this is a medical, oh, man, like nutritional recommendation, oh, right? Oh, I think I was reading this article where they were talking about like cable television. There's like explicit ways they need to say when something's a paid advertisement. But if it's like a paid piece of content where it's like a, a group thing done together, they can like bring in this like scientist and like say that this is like, you know, good and all that, but like it doesn't, it's not actually verified in any way. Yeah, no, I think there's definitely like, especially in this era with like this proliferation of fake news, I think to some degree you can get to this point where it's like there's so much information and content out there that it actually makes it so people are less informed. You can make a case for anything. You can make a case for why 
I mean, I guess in our business, why 401ks are the worst thing ever, or the best thing ever. And there's very cherry picked, somewhat researched Studies. things you could bring up. Yeah, and like in the study, it's not even lying. You just have very cherry picked data examples. So yeah, I mean, I think that idea, like that proliferation of fake news actually is a very large concern, especially in our industry, where it's like messing up someone's finances has such long-term detrimental effects. Do you see you guys using content creators moving forward? Obviously yeah. it helped really majorly at the beginning, but if you're raising the next round or scaling up, yeah. Does that really matter anymore or not as much? I think there's so many examples. Cash App being a phenomenal example. The amount of brand cachet that it has built. If anything, they were the underdog. Cash App, who used Cash App? It was Venmo. Like yeah. Venmo, it had the network effects. It had the social media aspect. It had the, the connections between friends. But Cash App was able to fully understand who their demographic was, who they wanted, who they trusted. I feel like if anything, content creators are going to be some of the best way to kind of disseminate this information, to give people this financial advice. So I actually see content creators being a significantly larger portion of our business, especially because education is so fundamental. Like what we're unlocking is liquidity, but a lot of people, they've never set up a 401k before. They've never set up their ESPP. They don't know what an IRA is. They barely understand taxes. So it's really important to both be able to build that trust, but also to be able to provide that educational content. And I think content creators are a fantastic way of being able to kind of um, disintermediate a lot of that information. If someone who is watching right now who's yeah. a content creator, is looking to start angel investing? Do you have any advice for them? How would they invest in a company like yours? I can give some like very tactical, direct like advice. Look at AngelList. Like if you're someone who's never met a startup before, like let's just say you don't know what Y Combinator is and you're just like, startups are interesting, but I know nothing about it. I think the first thing you can do, just like read news, like make sure to actually understand what's happening in the market. Get an idea of like the sectors you think you might have the most information on. Like you're probably not gonna be great at biotech unless you know something about biotech, but you might have a good idea of like consumer social companies because you might have a pulse on kind of what's happening there. So read up uh, on a lot of these articles, like look at TechCrunch, look at the information. Um, there's some kind of great tech journals and startup, and startup blogs. That'd be the first thing. I think the next thing is just building out your network of founders. A great way to do that is find someone who you think is a really compelling founder and just ask who are the other people in your network who you think I can talk with. And then just figure out random ways you can help. Maybe they need help, especially if you're a content creator. Make a piece on them, be like, hey, I might not even have that many. Yeah, exactly. I mean, genuinely, like, like, we'll even use me as an example. If you were to message me right now as a random person, be like, hey, I want to invest. We've raised, we're well capitalized. Um, so we don't necessarily need that money. But if you said, hey, I just put together an explainer video as to how your product works. And I shared it to a couple people. You know, it's got a hundred or so views. I'd be like, that's awesome. Like if you've driven me even half a customer, oh, you're in, fantastic. Like you've now become one of my best friends. <laughs> so that's how I'd start. A lot of these founders could use help with like content creation, explainer videos on their product, just like general, you know, SEO kind of publications. Um, and that's a great way to provide value. Also, it's so public. Like if you're now known as kind of like the investor who has this public face and presence of, hey, I help my founders get that first 10, $100,000 of revenue, Oh, I promise you, you can invest in any company you want. Like you can invest in any company if you want, that you want, if you can do something like that. What about normal people? So I've been talking to a lot of dentists, doctors who have the money and they're looking to maybe move out of the stock market given oh, I love how questions. crazy it's, yeah, yeah. it's been a bit. And then they're like, okay, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. Is yeah. the rug gonna get pulled? And they're looking to diversify into this, yeah. but they don't have that network. What's tricky is that there might be a more fundamental question of like, venture is very hot and sexy. You hear about all these companies raising it hundreds of millions of dollars and doing it in a year and you 300 extra money and that's great. But that also happens with like, you know, the creme of the creme of startups. There's a whole lot of dead startups in their wake who, you know, you put in 5,000, $10,000 and you never see it ever again. There are definitely like, there are like angel list syndicates you could look at. Uh, if you're wealthy enough, you might be able to get access to like a private equity fund or like a venture capital fund. But like the first thing you'd have to look at is like, what's your risk tolerance? Especially if you were making personal angel investments from your own money. And even more so if you're not like doing hundreds of investments, but you're like, I'm gonna do 20. You need to be comfortable earmarking that money and saying, I am fully okay if this goes to nothing. Because liquidity is also an aspect. Um, you know, most of the time, like if you were to invest in my startup, the expectation is that money is gonna be locked up for five years minimum. You still might get, you know, a thousand X on your money, which is fantastic. But again, you have this like five year minimum lockup period of when you don't get any of that money. So yeah, I think the first thing I'd say is like, look very long and hard about like my current capital position. What is the reason I'm trying to get involved in venture? Like, what is my risk tolerance? And then from there, understand of like, if you're gonna be doing personal angel investments, like what is your ads? Like, do you have some you know, unique way of being able to actually get access to these networks? Or do you have some idea 
of maybe you're just you know a doctor in a random part of the US, you don't know any startup founders. How are you gonna start networking and how are you gonna start building up those relationships? And I think for a lot of people, it's focusing on your domain expertise. What you know matters a lot more yeah. than anything else. What are your thoughts on Reg CF? Have you guys considered that? I actually ran a prior business. My co-founder is actually still running it. By the way, it's called uh, Alti Financial. You guys should totally check it out. Awesome company. Uh, and the whole idea was that we were helping give non-accredited investors access to private equity funds. I'm a huge proponent of it. I think specifically, and obviously this is, I'm impartial to this just in the form and case space, but I think specifically retirement accounts should have access to this. And the reason behind it is that liquidity is a problem with personal money in Robinhood. It would suck if you couldn't pull out any of your money from Robinhood. With a 401k, like it is inherently supposed to be illiquid. You're more comfortable with that illiquidity and the risk is less of a concern. Private equity and venture capital is riskier for sure. But if you're very diversified and if you have a 30 year investment horizon, this is why like endowments, I think, I think it was Yale's like endowment had like a phenomenal model showing this of like, it's not that risky over a 30 year investment horizon. So I 100% think that in like long term illiquid retirement vehicles like that, these non-accredited investors should absolutely have access. Because if you look at some of the best performing assets, it's like private equity and venture capital are the few assets where they actually do outperform the S&P. And the best thing is it's not correlated too. And that's because it's like, you could see a massive market downturn and venture can still do great because it's so long dated. It's like, you know, you've got this seven year window to when you actually see those gains. Even private equity, I mean, private equity can be really interesting too because a lot of the times when there's a downturn, that's actually- That's really, when they do the best, especially the turnaround. That's when they do the best, exactly. Now you're buying all these distressed assets. You're getting at very good prices. Like you actually, they wait for downturns. I previously worked on like Go Goldman Sachs's private equity team. Like they were almost looking for the next like, recession and they're like, all right, let's, Let's go. <laughs> this is when we thrive. Maybe a bit out of your domain expertise, but yeah, what percentage would you allocate towards, I guess, alternative investments and then specifically like venture and startup types? Yeah, yeah. So risk tolerance is big. I think it depends on your age. You know, if you're 60 and you're about to retire soon, very little would be allocated to that. Yes. Let's just say though, if we were to give a hypothetical, let's just say you are 30 years old, you've got a quarter million dollars in savings, which is decent amount. You're doing great. That's awesome. I'd say if you are kind of comfortable in the current job that you have and you know that you're going to be able to continue to make that amount of income and sustain yourself for a period, I think like, I mean, billionaires allocate 40% of their investment portfolio to alternative investments. I'd say if you had like $100,000 in your 401k, I would put as much of it as possible into these more illiquid assets because it's like that is already going to be an illiquid portfolio. The one thing is like I can say for me personally, I mean, if I, if I were to look at my own investment portfolio, I have almost all of my money in, I mean, a, a large portion of my network is obviously in Lendtable just because, you know, it's like you get this very asymmetric return of like maybe it's worth $10 billion, maybe it's worth nothing. And a lot of it is actually like prior startups I've done. It's like I have a whole lot of Yeezys because that's like the business I used to run. So I have like a million dollars in Yeezys um, and these other kind of like esoteric bets. So that portfolio's diversification is largely predicated on like risk. There's also like the time to upkeep it. Part of the thing with angel investing too is it's like if you want to make good bets. If you want to make better bets than you could make if you were to just like deal with the fee for like getting involved in a syndicate, you need to spend a decent amount of time. Like you need to network. You need to have high EQ. You need to show value as an actual investor and be able to get access to this deal flow versus just like, I will literally give anyone a check who talks to me who has a startup. And like, then you need to weigh, is it worth the time? What is my time currently worth? I'm working a 40 hour a week job. Like, could I supplement that with more income? Or is it kind of just like, you know, for some people it's like, I'm working 40 hours a week, but I literally couldn't take on really another job unless it was like, you know, minimum wage and that's not worth like the, the time. I mean, crypto is the greatest example though. Crypto is like a significantly easier way in theory of getting access to venture markets. That's a great example of like the hype cycles. You can see at Moon, like, I have a bunch of money in Dogecoin. That's fantastic. I'm also fully cognizant of the fact that, that might crash down to nothing. Sheridan's probably one of the smartest people out there. He went through Y Combinator, has met a ton of awesome other founders as well. Are there certain attributes that you would recommend looking for? Domain expertise is super important. You want to make sure that they're passionate about the actual industry that they're working in. You want to make sure that just generally smart, you know what I mean? Like someone who's capable and even if they were to pivot their product tomorrow to a totally different thing, you would back them as a founder. I think what that also ends up coming into is like grit is super important. Like someone where it's like, they're deeply passionate about what they're doing. They're grinding on this. At least for me, this is where other people might have other opinions, especially because I'm talking about younger founders. It's like all consuming. This is the thing they're focused on and they are just going to drive to any point to kind of see this to fruition. I think those are some of the kind of qualitative ones. And then I think like the, the quantitative things, you want to look at the actual business. It depends on the stage. If you're looking at like the earliest, like, hey, I've got an idea and maybe a prototype, you know, the 
basic checklist you want to go through is like, great, like what's the team? Who are the people on it? I want to make sure to be the most bullish on the team. The next is like, what's the market they're going after? Like if this thing is successful, will it be able to be a billion dollar, $10 billion, $100 million company? That's kind of how venture works. It's different if you want to invest in lifestyle businesses with more structure, but if you're trying to do like a venture back startup, if you don't think that it can get to a $10 billion company, it's not worth the investment because like a hundred million dollar exit, while it sounds great, you've 10X your money, like that doesn't perform well enough to make up for the other losses you've taken on other startups. So you need to see a massive possible exit. And then like, what's the product? What's it currently doing? What's the traction? How have people responded to it? Is this a real pain point that's out there? Can they make real money? How have they executed on the business so far? You gotta be cognizant though. I think a lot of people who are outside of, who are outside of the startup world, like when they're talking to these early startups, they're always looking for these like, traction numbers, like where you're at with revenue and where you're at with kind of, um, you know, profit margins. And while in other places outside of San Francisco, sometimes you can get these really phenomenal, like venture backable businesses. They don't know enough investors per se. And that's why they haven't raised, especially if you're thinking about investing in companies out in like Silicon Valley, you're going to need to start from like that first principle of like how phenomenal is the team? How big is the market they're going after? And then looking at like product and traction. If you're only waiting for like, I'm only going to invest in this company if it's got five million of revenue, it's like, okay, great, but like you're gonna invest at a very high valuation. What is your thoughts on Shark Tank? What's your view on it? I actually have a bunch of buddies who've been on Shark Tank. I think it's freaking awesome. I think it is not necessarily the best depiction of like what it's like to raise venture money. With that being said though, Shark Tank is for a lot of people who've like thought of doing companies or maybe have never thought of doing companies. And now they just get to hear about these new ideas. Shark Tank, I think from what I know, they love like lifestyle businesses. They like physical products. So it's less like the kind of like, you know, the world and scene I'm in is like digital, like tech, venture backable, yeah. yeah, software businesses, which, which is just different. It's like the way you actually build it, the way you think about it is different. Obviously it's very, it's showy. There are parts of it that are unrealistic, but like I've got two younger sisters and like they watch it. And like without that, I don't know if they'd have a whole lot of, you don't really see people like talk about their business, talk about the economics, talk about revenue. So one of the very common things in the Bay Area in tech is <laughs> a lot of seed and like successful series A level founders end up raising a small fund. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that process. What's the size of it? It was a friend of mine, uh, Stash, uh, who's also a kind of MIT dropout, 20, kind of my age, it's called Kronos. We ended up raising, uh, you know, the total kind of size of the fund was $10 million. The way it kind of started is I'm part of like the Teal Fellowship, which is just um, for essentially people who dropped out of school who are doing companies. Um, and there's about 20 people per batch. Also Y Combinator, Forbes 30 under 30, just like a bunch of groups, a bunch of really cool young people. And I think the way investing kind of kicked off for me is I was obviously doing this company Lend Table. Uh, I'd met a lot of founders before from just all the people I'd met in my previous life. And I was just like, wow, my friends are awesome. My friends are doing some phenomenal stuff. Yeah, and I think part of it just came down to just like, I just wanted to support my friends in any way possible. Uh, so like it started with like me giving people like five, $10,000 checks out of my own money. A couple of those investments ended up doing super well very quickly and then I just thought it kind of made sense of just like you know taking on some more capital like being able to write these like 50 to hundred thousand dollar checks and I think what's really cool is I've also had a lot of my friends founders I know my age do the same thing about making investments in a one table obviously a lot of different people you can kind of raise money from when you're looking at your company you can look at like wealthy kind of angels you can look at like these large funds you can look at syndicates and I think like the unique value proposition that the best introductions to get are from founders who have already raised money from that fund. So if it's like, hey, you know, Founders Fund has invested in you guys, those are the people you kind of want to ask. And if they're already invested in you, even better. Like it's even more of a kind of incentive to do it. Part of it is that just like that shared experience is that we have a lot of kind of great VCs, uh, institutional VCs backing our company. But at the end of the day, I'm 21. There's like different kind of nuances and complexities you have to deal with when kind of hiring people, firing people, understanding like how do you bring on people to the team who are older than you? who have kids with different life experiences and being able to get that kind of advice from the people who've done it or are currently doing it or thinking about doing it is super helpful. Get to just kind of, you know, run through these thoughts and experiments and half the time it's not even them descriptively telling you what to do and more so just a conversation about it. It's like, what are your thoughts? And then they kind of, they can kind of bounce back and give you what they're thinking and you can kind of come to this like mutual conclusion because like there's so much ambiguity and kind of complexity in this space that having a counterparty who's actually gone through those experiences and knows what you're doing and also, you know, can kind of serve as actually helping you hire these people and as part of these communities is super helpful. It sounds like you're in the intersect of pretty much a lot of very smart people and that's always the best spot to be in. Exactly. Yeah. Is it standard terms like 220 or what does that look like? Exactly. Standard terms of like, you know, 220 that we've kind of done for the fund. I think really like the reason that kind of, you know, LPs and investors came in, it was just like, 
They had kind of seen the people that were in my network. They had known a lot of the founders and I was saying it with a full chest. I'm like, I'm going to be making these investments myself either way. Part of it is like, there's like a bit of asymmetric information too. Whereas like a lot of these like pre-seed and seed investors, they're meeting these people kind of offhand and they're hearing like a, a fragmented version of like what's going on. I'm very good friends with a lot of the people that I've made money into. Like I know what's happening in their companies. I know the people who work at their companies. We hang out, we kind of go to events together. And that's like the level of like asymmetric information you have access to of like, no, like I know with a very strong conviction that this person's gonna be able to hit these milestones, kind of be able to hit these metrics. It's pretty much the business meeting versus going drinking with someone and hearing what's actually going on. Exactly, yeah. We're not taking lead investments. You know, we're not trying to, if you're raising $2 million, we're not trying to fill it out. I think it's just, you know, it's like an additional kind of side on. And what's the check size, like 50? K, 100K? Yeah, 50 to 100K. And I think part of what we found, I guess if we were to really go through like the pitch that we've given to investors, the advantage we have is the fact that like when it's one of my buddies who are just like raised an awesome round from an awesome investor, they'll give us allocation to come in for 50 or 100 grand, even if like they're way oversubscribed and they've got all these people who are interested and they've turned down all these other funds. The way they see it and the way, honestly, I've even seen it with my own company with giving you know, some funds access to it is like, this person's gonna be able to provide a very different level of benefit, a very different level of network when it comes to hiring, when it comes to thinking about, you know, even if, if, if you're looking at a new co-founder, if you're looking at new businesses to go into, all those things, that making a $50,000 allocation is very doable. That's part of the thing you need to do as an investor. You both need to be able to source incredible deals. But the next big thing is once you source those incredible deals, you need to make sure you can actually get in. It's not enough to just be like, great, I know all the best companies out there. I need to be able to actually deploy money into those companies. They need to be willing to take my money. And that's where I think kind of the advantages come from like on the sourcing side, as well as, you know, on the actual getting access to that deal flow and being able to make investments into those companies. The smaller checks might actually be the most impactful yeah. because they're incentivized to help you and they're trying to show their worth. And that's also why we kept kind of like the, the fund size small as well. You know, with the amount of money we have, we can deploy it just into people we're very close with. Obviously, if we had a hundred million dollars, you're in a different world. Like you now have a hundred million dollars you need to deploy. You're gonna need to find some founders, some people who are outside of your network. Not to say in any way that there's anything wrong with that. Like especially getting people from different backgrounds kind of outside your network is super important. Uh, but I think the advantage we kind of have with the amount of money we're deploying is we really can just be very targeted about we're only going into the people we know incredibly well. We know how well they're gonna do. So I'm actually, you know, more broadly very bullish on the segment of like these micro individual or kind of like two uh, GP fund managers because they can and deploy these checks into very targeted groups and they don't feel this constraint of, oh my God, I need to figure out how to deploy a hundred million dollars. And I might not have a hundred million dollars worth of good deal flow, but I have a hundred million dollars worth of money I need to write. Do you only do seed, pre-seed, or like do you do any follow-on stuff? We just did uh, one of our first follow-ons um, yeah, recently um, where it's like, you know, they'd kind of, uh, they'd done like a, like a 20X on kind of like the prior valuation we put in at, which is great. Um, we kind of followed them on throughout. So yeah, the focus is making uh, writing checks kind of pre-seed and seed. And then yeah, once they kind of do a, a series A, especially with the ones who we think are killing it, like doing those kind of follow-on checks. And does valuation really matter for you or is it more like TAMP, like total addressable market and like how it can grow. For us, when it kind of comes to those pre-seed and seed investments, like we're not necessarily trying to make some big check at the first time at the Series A. So it's like the valuation ends up being relevant. Now, the difference between a one and a $2 million valuation, while it's double, it's one of those things where it's like, it's either going to work really well and it's going to be at a position where it's like in the next six months, a year, they're raising it at 25 or it's not. So like we definitely have more flexibility there at that range. We're not really trying to do like initial checks where it's at a valuation above like a 10 million. We're really trying to sit in that pre-seed, seed, sweet spot and then do follow-on checks. Do you see the venture market, or I guess the startup valuation market, cooling down a little bit? Everyone always talks about it. It's impossible to know what's gonna happen in the future. Do I think that it will? I don't know. Do I think that there's a good chance that it does? Absolutely. That's part of the advantage though about getting so early. At, we're doing it like just as like the product is kind of exiting on a beta, just as like, you know, that initial team's being formed, you're putting in a million dollar, $2 million check. You know, we're very comfortable with like, hey, if that market cools off, you know, they're still in a position where they can kind of raise at a you know, better valuation, but like, that's not the thing we're optimizing for. We're not just trying to get, so like they have the best markup on like their next round. We're getting in early with people where it's like, regardless of the idea, regardless of even the product they're currently working on, we know that this team is gonna figure out what to build. In terms of the checks you took in for the funds, 
Was there like a minimum size? What does that look like for people not familiar with that? For us, we ended up doing a minimum check size of 10 grand. It's not a rolling fund. Right? Not a rolling fund. Yeah, this was like a traditional uh, kind of fund structure. I think we kind of just ended up like picking that number because it seemed to make sense. We wanted to make sure to kind of let some of our friends on as well with kind of lower amounts. For people who are interested in kind of investing in venture funds, like the way I've done it before, like I put some money in like syndicates, some of my other friends are running funds as well. Honestly, part of the aspect of it that I like so much is that just like having, even if it's not a huge amount of equity incentive in someone's up side. It's like this idea of like, I would have already helped this person for sure. But especially when you feel like, oh, you know, and because of this, like it also marginally increased my, you know, kind of my money by this much. It's a nice oomph to kind of put behind like these, you know, these things you're doing. That's part of the great aspect of it too. Like, I think that's why we personally, you know, took money uh, from some of these like smaller VC funds, uh, from some of these like individual managers. Cause it's like those people, they're very well connected. They're kind of growing in similar spaces as us. And they've been a lot of the times some of our most helpful people. Cause it's like, they know the folks we should hire. They know the other product opportunities for us to look at. They're figuring out these experiences kind of as it goes along too. So what are your thoughts in terms of balancing, obviously your startup that's growing really fast and doing very well, and this fun side of things. Priority is absolutely the startup. I think what's what's kind of cool is that as the as kind of Lent table does better, just like the access to deal flow that people I'm meeting does even better as well. So like there's an even added incentive uh, to kind of- It's like a snowball effect. Yeah, it's snowball effect. Part of the reason behind it is I actually think it's very beneficial to Lent table is that like with a lot of these founders, like they ended up serving as the, the kind of introductions and conversations to this round. And a lot of the people were bouncing ideas off of. So yeah, and we were, I was very explicit with the kind of people we'd raise money from too. Like this is by no means a full-time job at all. This is like the people who I'm, just naturally meeting throughout the kind of day-to-day -day process um, who are making these, uh, the, these kind of like investments into. Any other advice for founders considering doing their own rolling fund or their own secondary fund on the side while running a startup? You shouldn't be spending a lot of time on it. If you are, like that's probably not a good fit. Like I'm, I'm doing five to 10 hours a week. A lot of it's like on the weekend. It's really, it's just like talking with a lot. It's more fun to just like talk with these people, hear about how their companies are doing, especially like I love FinTech. We're working in FinTech. I've actually learned a lot of things about how we can best kind of support our business through it. Yeah, and then, I mean, if you have a network of kind of, uh, you know, investors in your current company, they could be great candidates for doing it. But only do it if you really like talking with other founders too. Like if, if you don't like doing that, why do it? Flipping the script a little bit, Please. do you think there's an issue with the Bay Area and tech? Everyone's kind of like pumping each other's valuations up a bit. I mean, there is definitely a lot of companies that are might be worth $25 million on paper that implode. I've built companies in Chicago. Um, companies I built in Chicago, we couldn't raise any venture money. For my sneaker business, we had a very significant amount of revenue. Like we're talking $25 million of revenue, not a single VC. I didn't even know a VC. So I think there's definitely this, this case to be made that there is like a massive lack of representation of like I, VCs not putting in capital to a lot of these businesses that would be great, but aren't located in San Francisco who might not be as connected. I will say though, from a founder perspective, while that's frustrating, you also just like should do everything possible to best increase the likelihood of being able to get to that, you know, like uh, terminal value. That means like hiring the best people, having a phenomenal network of these people where you can get access to this capital. Like, you don't want to have the hardest time fundraising. You want to have the easiest time fundraising. My co-founder and I are both African-American. African-American fundraising representation, I think is like 0.6%. It's abysmally low. And there's actually this crazy statistic where it's like African-American folks actually start a lot of companies. Like when you can't get access to a job or you might not have as easy access to education, your path towards this stuff is you actually have to start a company. I think there's a lot of people who could be phenomenal founders and have phenomenal companies if they just had access to the capital and the people to make it so. And as a result of Silicon Valley being so closed off, that doesn't happen. You're very bullish on San Francisco. I think a lot of people yes. we know in yes, Texas yes, yes. and other places or Miami are like, why do you like San Francisco? Oh. It's but like, what are your thoughts there? I think you just have the greatest concentration of ultra smart people. If your optimization is cheap rent and fun things to do and things like that, this is so not the place for you. It's, it's just so not the place. I think there's been like this exodus of like VCs. If you've made your money and you're working 30, 40 hours a week and you wanna have a great time, go to Miami, go to LA ball out. Absolutely. I don't see why you wouldn't. I have a lot of people who I would consider my most successful friends, most driven friends who are moving out here. And I think that's because I've worked in Chicago. I've worked in New York. Um, I've even done a little bit of work in Miami and there's just the greatest density ever of ultra successful, ultra driven people. And I think all of that, that mindset, um, those people, those networks very much so compound when everyone else around you is trying to build a billion dollar unicorn. And a lot of them have built those billion dollar unicorns. You really start to think like, Hmm, not only can I do it, I should be doing it like like what excuse do i have like i know that person he, that person she, he or she is very cool but like 
I can be that person. Like, I, I know what that person does. Like, they're not that much better than me. And that's what I love. It's like this level of competition, but also like Silicon Valley is this network where everyone wants to help. Like there's this huge incentive of like, if you were just known as the person who is the most helpful, you're gonna kill it. Like if everyone knows you, it's just like, wow, if you need, if you need anything, Sheridan, that's the guy you go to. Like that's, that's fantastic. Like everyone wants to work with you. Everyone wants to, you know, work for you or like kind of give you access to these opportunities. And you just get such smart people working on such crazy innovative things. Phenomenally gifted, phenomenally driven, uh, phenomenally passionate about what they're doing. So I'm like so, so, so bullish on San Francisco. I mean, this is by far and away the best place I've ever lived. Like it is just like the community of people out here. I feel like it was like a huge multiplier on the kind of impact I've been able to drive to my companies. One thing I really like <laughs> is the fact that people in San Francisco will actually meet with you. There's people in Miami who just won't give you the time of day. Oh, the way I've heard it described before is it's like in some other, maybe like LA where it can be like very, um, obviously celebrity based, it can kind of be zero sum. It's like either you get this part or someone else gets this part. You both can't have this part. There's not two lead roles. Whereas in San Francisco, like it's very positive sum game of like, you can have someone who's really successful. You can connect them with all these people. They end up doing really well from that. Then they connect you with all these people. You end up doing really well from that. And it's not like you guys are taking any, away from anyone's spotlight. Everyone's spotlight just grows. The pie just grows. Yeah, it's just like you make a bigger company um, and th from that bigger company, it reinforces all these network effects that make everything else bigger. So it's like, there's this like heavy incentive of just like try to multiply as much uh, as you can with other people. And like, that's just gonna end up coming back to you. Two of our advisors, when they first helped me, like I didn't know anyone out in the Valley. Mitchell, my co-founder, we also didn't know that many folks. And they're just like, hey, like I like you. I like your story. I think you're a cool kid running a cool startup. I'm just gonna connect you with everyone. There was nothing I could have provided to him at that point, other than just like, I don't know, maybe buying him a drink. But he just did it. I was like, I'll connect you with a hundred people. I mean, this is fantastic. Like I'm so appreciative for it. While at the time it was literally just him being helpful. Like there was no kind of like, I, I didn't owe him anything. There was no like anything like that. The second I had the opportunity to be like, hey, like we're looking for advisors. Like we're looking to give out equity. Would you guys like to come on? They were the first people we called and we were thrilled to do that. You know what I mean? Like we were like, you've already helped out so much. We want you guys to be a bigger part of it. I think like it, it all kind of compounds. Tell us about Lentable. The quickest way to describe Lentable is we give people cash advances so that they can max out their 401k match and employee stock purchase plan. Specifically, you know, what that means is let's say you're someone who works at a company with a 401k match. For those who might not know what that is, let's just say you're at Dropbox. They tell you if you put in $5,000 to your 401k, they'll match it and give you another 5,000. Sounds awesome, right? 100% return on your investment. Why wouldn't everyone use that? Well, there ends up being a lot of people where it hurts to take a $5,000 reduction to your paycheck. It's awesome to get a $5,000 return, but that money gets locked up. So what we do is we actually make those contributions for people on their behalf. And what that means, we will give you that $5,000 upfront so that you can then put it in your 401k. And the way that we get paid back is once you have the ability to kind of withdraw it, you can then pay us back the principal, which is the 5,000 we've given you, and we take a 10% split. So we get 10% of that 401k match offered by your company, but you get to keep 90% of it. So that's $4,500 in your 401k that you wouldn't have had before. So before actually coming over here, we did a survey on Instagram and about 30% of you guys don't do the 401k match, which that's, I was pretty surprised oh, by. Oh wait, that's such a cool survey. I guess a big part of it is probably people who don't have the liquidity, but yes. on your end, have you seen any data or information saying like why that's the case? It's predominantly liquidity. We've got a bunch of people who like have worked at Walmart, have worked at Walgreens, have worked at Taco Bell. They make 40, 50, 60K a year and they just can't. They have to give up a $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 reduction to their paycheck. So those are the clear cases where it's just like they outright can't afford to kind of make that contribution. I think what's interesting is we actually have people who use our service who make more money though, who make 150, 250. I think our um, highest paid user makes about 350,000. And for them, in some cases, they're actually already using their 401k match, but like they work at a company where it ends up requiring them to put in like $10,000 plus another 20,000 for their employees that purchase plan. It's a lot of money. So the reason they use one table isn't because they can't use their 401k match, but more because they value having that liquidity. So we're like, hey, we'll make that contribution for you. And then instead of having to have that $35,000 of yours locked up, you can put it in kind of the investments you want, whether that be, you know, putting money down for a house, something for your kids. We've had some people just put it into crypto. Actually, someone did it about six months ago where they're like, hey, like I really want to just put this money in crypto and not put it in my 401k, but I'm obviously not going to give up the free money my company gives me. That person has made off tremendously well. I think they made like $150,000. For the base product though, it's pretty much risk-free 
three, I would say. Are there any disadvantages? I think the only thing to kind of take into account is if you're someone who already uses your 401k match, you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons of like, am I okay kind of giving up like a small portion of my match because I value the liquidity. I will say, if you are someone who isn't currently using your match, it's just strictly more money in your 401k that you would have had. And like the way we guarantee that is like the way we set up our kind of uh, policy is that we just take a percentage of the profit we make you. So if for whatever reason, if you get laid off, if you get fired, if your company goes down and you don't get your match, you don't owe us any of, there's no like additional fee, there's no prepayment penalty. Genuinely, like we just get, you know, 10% of the money we help you access. And if you're not getting money, great. You know, that's, we take no profit split. We just get our money back. A really common question we get asked is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How am I repaying you? Like, I thought I have to pay income tax and an early withdrawal penalty. Aren't I gonna be kind of in the negative here? And we actually take all those things into account when we give you the money. The way that we do that is we give you money on an after-tax basis. So say, for example, you've got a Roth 401k at your company. What will happen is you'll contribute $5,000 to your Roth, and that'll be after-tax. So that's like the amount of money you miss from your paycheck. So we're like, great, here's $5,000. As far as you're concerned, your paycheck is exactly the same as if you hadn't contributed to your 401k. Then your company gives you another 5,000, which is great. You got 10,000 in total. And then when it comes time to repay, because that's when your money's vested, you can then pull it out of your 401k. Because it's a Roth, you've already paid tax, so there's no tax on the withdrawal. 5,500 comes out, that pays off our principal plus the $500 split. You get to keep 4,500. Now, I know I kind of said some math there. The easiest way to think about it though is when you sign up with one table, you get to keep 90% of your 401k match after everything is said and done, after all taxes, anything like that. That's money in your pocket that you wouldn't have had. Is there a use case where it wouldn't make sense? The easiest example, if you're a millionaire and you can already use your match, you, pro you probably don't need us. Like you can already afford to get that contribution. You have all this money in the bank. The biggest thing I'll say is if you are not currently using your 401k match, there's only one of two things you should do. Either use your 401k match yourself or use Lendtable. There is absolutely no reason that you should not be getting the free money offered by your employer. Because the thing is, if you don't use it this year, that money's gone. If your company's offering you $5,000 match in 2021, if you do not get it this year, you can never get that $5,000 back. You can do it next year, which is great, but you can't get the $5,000 from this year. Let's say they wanna do this right now. What would be like the four steps that they would do? So simplest thing is you can sign up at Lendtable.com. If you don't even know your 401k match, let's just say you're like, I think I have one, but I'm not sure. We actually can kind of walk you through that process, show you what your match is. We've got a calculator right at the front of our site, where as long as you tell us your income and who you work for, your employer, we can let you know exactly how much money you'll make by signing up. Do you guys only do the portion that's the match or do you also go up to the 19,500 amount, the tax? That's a great question. So right now we just do the 401k match amount. In the future, we wanna be able to help you get the whole amount because of the tax advantages. But for right now, it's like, if your company uh, says that they'll contribute 6%, you know, if you contribute 6% of your salary, then we'll help you get the 6%. Another thing to mention though, is if you are already using some of your 401k match, like let's just say your company lets you contribute 10% to get the full match and you're contributing 5%. We don't have to do the full amount. We can help you get the extra 5%. One thing that a lot of people who are new to startup are concerned about is whether the company's gonna go out of business yeah. in a month or two or is this a fly-by-night operation? Yeah. Can you talk a bit more about that? Got some of kind of the best FinTech VCs out there, uh, funds like SoftBank and Valor and Y Combinator. So we've got some great kind of FinTech uh, VCs back in the business, as well as some really good advisors. So we've got, you know, Steve Sarowitz, who's the founder of Paylocity, which is a $10 billion HR and benefits company. The company, knock on wood, yeah, 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 please. goes bankrupt or something <laughs> crazy happens. Like what's the impact for the person using a service like That's a great question. So I'll actually say something crazy happens. Like something happens to me and my co-founder and just like, you know, the company goes under. Honestly, you guys would just get that money. I'll just be very direct. So if the company were to go bankrupt tomorrow and we give you this $5,000, most likely what will end up happening is not only do you get your 401k match, but you also just get to keep the $5,000 we've given you. That's hilarious because I had a startup doing lending for coding boot camps, and yep. what pretty much happened was we went out of business, and then the loans were like, okay, it's just free money. It's yeah. pretty much a loan that turned into a scholarship. So not that you guys should be excited if we go out of business, because we'd love to continue to help you get your match over the course of 40 years, but 
honestly, if we do go out of business, the money we give you is probably just yours to keep. <laughs> so one thing that is a bit tough right now is that the market is going crazy. So even if you're matching me 100%, maybe I can 500%. So that's probably one of the greatest use cases for why you use Lendtable. This is why some people who can already afford to contribute are using us because they're like, hey, I do want to put my money in crypto. I do want to put my money in maybe a mean stock. And we're like, you absolutely can do that. Like instead of having to put in 20 grand into your 401k, we'll do it for you. And then that 20 grand you would have put in, you can now do anything you want with. What's been the worst customer experience? So on our end, working with a customer, there are some people who just sign up who are just like, hey, I just want money. And we're like, do you have a 401k match? And they're like, no. And they're like, do you have any SPP? And they're like, no, I just want money. And we're like, we can't really do that. And they're like, but like, can you do that? So that, that's always kind of funny. Of just people who just like literally, they see that we give out money and they're like, great, I just want to get money. For, just yeah. for no reason. They're not even giving, they're not even trying to lie. They're just like, I just want money. Let's just be direct. I think the worst kind of customer experience that someone ha has had with Lentable, probably it came, you know, from like uh, the initial kind of like early inception of the business. Like we were still doing a lot of things manually. We were still trying to, a lot of it was, you know, customer service based. And a lot of it was kind of um, still kind of figuring things out. So I think we've done a lot of work to make sure that we've kind of ironed out some of those kinks. And at the end of the day, the biggest thing we care about here is we know we are never going to be a billion dollar company unless we genuinely help people make money. Like if someone has an experience with Lentable in the first year and they don't see more money in their bank account, if they do not feel like they are net better, they're not going to use us again. We need that. Like we need people. It's really important to us to have these users who are actually using our service over a long period of time. And we know we can do that because we know we provide value, but it's incredibly important that we're as customer centric as possible and actually making sure that they feel comfortable with what's happening. I mean, we're cognizant. We're dealing with people's retirement savings. We're dealing with their 401k. It's a touchy subject, you know what I mean? Personal finances can be scary and you don't want to mess it up. So it's something we're hyper cognizant of. It's always trying to make sure, like when you have questions, you, you can talk with someone on the customer service team. You can talk with someone on the business success team. Um, so we make sure that we're kind of taking care of you. We talked about options. Uh, do you mean employee stock purchase plan? Yes. Yeah, we have two products. One is 401k matches. The second product we do though is something called an employee stock purchase plan. So for those who might not know, the way that that plan typically works is let's take Tesla as an example. What they say is you can contribute 15% of your salary. So let's say you make $100,000 a year. To max out this benefit, you have to give up 15K out of your paycheck. The reason that you do that though, is because you can now buy your company stock at a 15% discount in six months. So what that means is that you put in $15,000, Tesla's stock price is currently at 100 bucks at the end of the six month period, you get $15,000 worth of shares at an $85 share price. And you can sell it today, which is awesome. That means you make a 15% return, that's an extra close to $2,000 in your bank account. Phenomenal. Where employee stock purchase plans are really amazing is a lot of the times they'll give it to you at the lowest price over that period. So what that means is like if your company stock falls, the last price it's at is 100 bucks, you just get a discount to that, you can sell it immediately. But if your company stock goes up, the lowest price over the period was 100, but the stock is currently worth $300 or $500. So you can buy it at the discount to that $100 price and sell it today at the $500 price. Is the look back period generally six months, 12 months? G generally six months. So actually speaking of meme stocks, GameStop, games, if you are a GameStop employee, the only thing you should be doing right now is making sure that you are maxing out your employee stock purchase plan. I cannot be more serious about it. It is actually $30,000 from this. And the best case is you cannot lose money on it because you can sell it right now and you get that lowest price guaranteed. Obviously, Lentable is more than happy to help you get that contribution from GameStop, but at the very least, make sure you're using that contribution from GameStop. Ironically, I think in this environment, it actually makes a lot of sense given how volatile stocks have been. Exactly, it's even better. So yeah, that's the second product we serve as well. You know, is that if you can't, you don't have the money to put in to get your ESPP, or if you're not currently using it, or if you just would prefer to have that extra liquidity, we can also help you with that as well. Are there any credit implications for the Lend Table cash advance? So right now, no. In the near future, we actually wanna make it so it positively boosts your credit. When you pay it off, you're actually paying off what is a large loan, and well, one thing we kind of want to say is, uh, is that we don't really view this as a loan. Obviously, we're giving you money and you know, we end up getting money back. But really, it's more akin to like a profit split agreement, an income share agreement of like, hey, we're very explicit. Like, we're just getting 10% of the money we're making for you. If we don't make money for you, 
We're not making money from it, just, just straight up. Our whole goal is to find all the different ways that we can make you more money. In the near future, we wanna make it so it's like, hey, you just paid off what is a $5,000 loan. Uh, so we want that to go to like positively boost your credit. What happens if you need to withdraw your money, if something in life happens, how does that work? Sometimes there can be like this thing that people underneath the age of 59 and a half deal with called an early withdrawal penalty. And we actually like bake that in to part of our calculation. So the only difference is that if you're above 59 and a half, the way the economics break down is like, you get 90% of your match and we get 10%. If it's a $5,000 match, you're left with 4,500, we get a $500 split. And then in the event where there's like a 10% early withdrawal penalty, the number just becomes you get 80% of your match, the government gets 10%, and you know we get that 10%. But the thing is, this is still 80% of that match that you didn't have before, where you weren't getting any of that contribution. And really our goal is to be as flexible and as helpful with users as possible. So like, if your financial position does end up changing, or if you want to repay early, we're more than happy to kind of do that. There's no early repayment fee. There's no like onerous penalties on top of it. So what happens if someone ends up getting fired from their job mm -hmm. before that match happens? Yeah, yeah. So if someone gets fired, if you don't get your match, if you know, a company goes bankrupt, we don't charge anything, okay. just outright. If you don't get your match, if you don't make money, we don't make money. We are in it to help you make as much money as possible. We get a percentage of that profit. If there's no profit to be had, there's no penalty. So do they just return the capital to you? Just return the capital, exactly. If you want to check out Lend Table, link will be down below. Thanks, Sheridan, for taking the time to chat. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. This is fantastic. Big favor is to give this a thumbs up, but otherwise, see you guys next time.